So today's lecture is about uh, some, 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 some practical and relevant aspects in relation to uh, applying regularization methods to solve inverse problems. Some uh, issues that are quite important uh, but that are probably easier to explain in terms of a few practical examples than just going uh, through some, some theory. So that's, that's what basically we're going to be doing today. Uh, but before that, let me just say that the, uh, what, 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 is it really, what is really the goal? What is it we want to achieve in the end when we have understood everything about solving inverse problems? That is to be able to devise what I call here a, a working regularization algorithm. And you see there are definitely uh, three aspects of that. The first thing is you, you have to uh, choose a regularization method. Uh, how you want to regularize the problem, you want to do that by, by Tikhonov regularization, truncated singular value decomposition, if you can compute the SVD, or maybe iterative methods that we'll get to later. Okay, so you have to, to, to choose a method how to regularize. Then, but you, there are other ingredients that you also need to have. You, ha you need to have a parameter choice method, and we talked about that already. So that could be like the, the, the generalized cross-validation or L-curve normalized cumulative periodogram whatsoever, but you also need that because you want to automate the choice of the regularization parameter. And then finally, <laughs> you know, if you may want to make this useful, you, you, you have to do an implementation uh, in whatever uh, programming language is suited for you and you have to think about how you actually want to implement that and maybe by, by a set of mo modules that you can fit together and so on and so forth. And um, so, so what I'm saying today is of course uh, related to, uh, to, to these issues here but, but in connection with uh, a few uh, cases that we are, are going to be studying. So the next slide here is a checklist for you know, how to, how to think about these working regularization algorithms, but this is way too much text. It's not suited for, for a lecture. So, so that's in the book and you can read about it there. So, so instead, uh, let me get to the, to the first uh, example here, the first case, that will illustrate a few very important aspects of dealing with inverse problems. This here is uh, the barcode reading problem. Right, and maybe let me just skip ahead a few uh, slides to number five here. Right, so let's see. In a barcode reader that you know from like supermarkets, uh, you, you have a one-dimensional problem because you just want to, 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 to scan the barcode and think of it as a 1D signal of black and white or zeros and, and ones here. And that's the, that's the blue line here on top. But, but the, the, the optical system in a barcode reader is, is, is not fantastic uh, quality uh, optics. It's just probably a plastic lens uh, it, and it may be out of focus. So instead of measuring such a sharp, nice signal, you, you measure a, a blurred signal like the red one here on the middle plot. And, um, and, and what we would like to have is a way of, of coming from from, from that red signal back to the sharp exact signal, the blue one there. And the model for doing that is of course to set up a model for what blurring goes on in, in this uh, optical system. And we can, we can write that in that uh, 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 integral equation we, we see up here. So again, the right hand side G, that's the measured blurred signal. And also typically there's some noise on that. And the unknown sharp, signal is the function f and then it's, uh, it's, 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 it's multiplied with the kernel and then integrated up here. And uh, here we assume that the, that the kernel, the point spread function, is a Gaussian function there. So it's, very, it's a very simple system here uh, that is again, once again a Friedholm uh, integral equation of the first kind and of course the, the kernel is, is uh, this guy here on the, on the bottom uh, equation and you see uh, there are the two uh, variables s and t that represent the two axes and, and then there's a, there's a third parameter, there's a sigma here, this is a sigma 
sigma squared that controls the amount of blurring going on in this um, in, in this system here. So, and, and, and what I do here on, let's see, on this plot here is that I also show you the kernel. And I show it only out here, but think of the kernel as a function that is zero everywhere except uh, somewhere it has, a, it's a, it has a bump, bump like that. And then of course when you, when you multiply that, that kernel with the, the sharp signal and you do the integration, then you arrive at the red blurred signal that you see down there, all right? Um, so this kernel here, let me back up once more, has a very special structure in that you see it, so it's a function of s and t, but in fact they appear in such a way that the function only depends on the difference between s and t. Okay? And when that is the case, this is a special case of kernels of course, and when that is the case we, we say that the operation here is called a convolution. And it's a convolution between two signals, f and h, right? And of course, uh, in this particular notation here, that is my, my, my kernel sitting right there. Um, so getting from the sharp signal to the blurred signal is a convolution. And for obvious reason, getting back from the from the, from the blurred signal to the sharp signal is called deconvolution. So, and, and, and when I talk about deconvolution, I mean for the specific case when we actually have a kernel that has this, this special form here. Some people though uh, use the word deconvolution for all other inverse problems as well, so that might be a little confusing. But here, it's when we have this special situation here, right? And then of course, we want to, to uh, uh, compute a regularized solution and for example if we if we plug all this into the uh, uh, mechanism that we have already established we compute the singular value decomposition we compute a truncated SVD solution we get something that that looks a bit like that so so that's all right yeah so, but, but, but there's, there's more to say because actually for these particular problems we, we can do things more efficiently than just use a brute force uh, singular value decomposition approach. So uh, in order to do that, let, let's see what happens when we actually discretize the problem. And we choose one particular way to discretize the problem that is particularly suited here. Uh, because it, it, it gives some nice mathematical structure. And so we discretize by means of the midpoint quadrature rule, right? So we have um, uh, n quadrature points, and then we use collocation to set up the system, and we also have n collocation points, right? Here are the quadrature points and the collocation points, and when we plug that into the kernel, that's what we do here, um, then we... Uh, we just plug that in here, and we see now the, uh, remember the matrix, the matrix elements here are essentially samples of the, of the kernel, okay? And I, in fact, I have ignored a factor one over n here, the step length in the quadrature rule. I, I have skipped that because it, it, it's, it's not important for the presentation here, uh, but you'll notice if you compare the book that that factor one over n is missing. So anyway, in principle, this, this is what you do. So you see the matrix elements here, the matrix elements of the A coefficient matrix are given by this expression here. And again, you see at the, that they only depend on the difference between I and J. Mm -hmm. so, so, so we, also, we, we, we have a particular form of this matrix here where every matrix element here it depends on only the difference between the two indices i and, and j and we'll get, we'll get back to that. But anyway, when we take this stuff here uh, this, and, and plug it in, this, this discretization model, then it turns out that we can write the equations like the bottom equation right there. Okay, so, so that what, that's what we'll just refer to, a discrete convolution. So it's just a particular way of writing things out for, the, for, the, for that choice here of the midpoint quadrature rule to discretize the problem. Anyways, and the matrix elements are given by that relation there. 
Huh. So that's a very special matrix structure that we got right there. And matrices that have this structure here are called Toplitz matrices, or uh, uh, Toplitz, I guess I should say. I think he was uh, German. Uh, the man who uh, gave, uh, whose name is associated with this matrix. Yeah, so, so, so here's an example of a matrix that's Toplitz, uh, and you see uh, you have the same elements along all the diagonals, uh, off diagonals it's the same element like this here. This in fact is a symmetric Toplitz matrix. And uh, that, that's a very nice um, structure to have, and in, in a little while we'll see why is that is a very nice structure. And in particular for the matrix associated then for this test problem here with a, uh, a barcode reading, the, the coefficient matrix can be generated very easily in, in MATLAB by means of that expression there. MATLAB has a built-in function to generate topless matrices and, and you only give them like the first row or column uh, for a symmetric topless matrix. So that's, that's very nice. Actually, at this time I want to mention uh, yet another um, structured matrix that is also good to know. So it's, again, this is, this is a, a Toplitz matrix, but it has some additional uh, properties that we can, we can, we can, it, 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 it corresponds to discretization of periodic functions, right? And, and, and so we have the, the, the periodicity written uh, up here. And, um, and um, when, then, then we, when, when, when we discretize and we look at the matrix elements, they also have periodicity in, in, the, in the subscript, like the middle e e equation right here. So that means that we have a matrix that, that uh, has this special structure here for the, for the matrix elements. And uh, it's not so easy to, uh, to maybe recognize the structure by looking at these equations. So again, let's, let's look at an example here. And um, right, so the, the matrix A here is a circulant matrix. And again, you see along all the diagonals and off diagonals, um, we, have, we have the same element. So certainly this is a... Um, uh, Toplitz matrix, but then let's let's look at what happens here because something special happens here. Let's let's look at the first subdiagonal. That's the elements four, 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 and then there's like a you could think of a four spilling over the edge here of this matrix here, right? It it, it, it and and but then it comes in back here. So so it it comes in again in a cyclic fashion. It goes out here and comes in over here. So, circulant, that's what we mean here. And for the next one here, look at the three, 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 and then again, it spills over here. There's a, maybe a three there and a three there. So then come in at the bottom here, and so on and so forth. So that's actually very easy to see what goes on. That's a, that's a circulant matrix. Uh, and we like circulant matrices very, very much because it's very easy to compute singular value decompositions and eigenvalue decompositions of such matrices. And uh, you can read a lot about that in the lecture. literature. I'm not going to go over that here. Here are just a few references where, where, where it is explained how to utilize that particular structure there. And we will return to it in, in, a, in, in a little while. Uh, but it's essentially, uh, uh, fa we can utilize fast algorithms based on the fast Fourier transform or the discrete cosine transform. Right. So I wanted to mention that uh, it's, it's a good thing to, to look for structure, matrix structure, coming from the properties of the original problem, because maybe you, you'll be able to, uh, to utilize that, that structure somehow. And it, how to utilize it is basically explained in, in these references and in many other references. Now I want to look at Another case here, another example, which illustrates, well, we'll, be en we'll end up talking about boundary conditions, okay? And um, so essentially, uh, this is something that is useful when there is a, 
a mismatch between the simple mathematical model we have set up and the actual problem that, that we are solving. And I'm illustrating it in, in, in this way here. Let's see, let's see. How do we go on about this? Let's see, there's an exact, this is the, man, I should, I should, I should make a, a sketch here. It's the uh, 1D uh, gravitational problem here. So we have uh, up here, that's the surface of the Earth. And then at a certain, certain depth, D, uh, we have a one-dimensional distribution of mass. And that may, for example, take the form, we could assume it's zero, then it goes up here, it's non-zero, and then it goes down like that to something else, and it is, it's zero everywhere again. So that would be the function f of t that I'm trying to actually reconstruct. So if I, if, I, if I measure the gravitational field from this mass distribution here on top of, on here on the surface, I'm going to measure my, my right hand side g of s. Right. Okay, so what do we have here? The blue line here. So these are measured this is the measured field, so this is related to the function g here, and the dots just uh, kind of illustrate that I, I sample that function, and those sampled values are what goes into my right-hand side, b, right? And so I will, I will measure a function that looks like the blue curve here, and of course I can measure this uh, everywhere, not just along the axis here from, from zero to one, and of course, as I move outside that interval here into the negative region, region here, or beyond uh, one over here, then of course my measured signal is going to die, because with, with this model here, the, the, the function f is actually zero out here, and it's zero out there. So sure enough, if that was the case, I would measure that one there. But it could also be the case that um, this mass distribution here into the ground is, is not zero outside this interval of, of interest. It could actually be the case that it was constant here and it follows this one here and it continues outside of that interval from, uh, from zero to one uh, as another constant, okay? That might as well be the case, we don't know. If that is the case, then we would measure a completely different signal on the surface of the Earth. Then we would measure the, the right signal here. And now, of course, since there's contribution from outside the interval from zero to one, uh, this this red function here will continue like a constant here and a constant there, while in the middle here, you know, it'll look exactly like the blue one because at, 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 at around here it doesn't feel any contribution from, from far away. But you see there is a mismatch. All right. Okay. So let's, let's now assume that what we measure is actually a situation corresponding to the red curve. Let's assume that's what we actually measure because the situation below ground corresponds to the, to the infinitely long line there that is non-zero everywhere. But if we plug this into our discretization scheme that we have talked about so far, then there's actually an implicit assumption that um, Uh, that the solution is, is, is like the first one I showed here that is zero outside the interval. So that's an implicit assumption when we derive the, uh, the, the, the matrix equations. 
All right. Uh, so then there's a mismatch between what we try to reconstruct and what is the true solution, okay? And this mismatch means that when we solve the inverse problem, we will get a solution that corresponds to the red dashed line down here. And you see at the, towards the ends of the interval, we really don't get the solution that we are supposed to get, but we get something that is, com that is completely wrong. And that is because the reconstruction model that assumes we have zeros outside the interval doesn't, doesn't fit with the actual data uh, that comes from a signal that is not zero outside this particular interval. So you hope, you, I hope you can see that uh, this mismatch between what we assumed when setting up the model and the actual data we have, that can give some severe artifacts here. And then of course you could just ignore it out there, but l let's try to see if we can do better than that. Right. So, so that's what I explained in, in the text there on slide 10, and it's illustrated on slide 11. But uh, so, okay, so, so what we have done so far in this course here is actually we have solved problems where there's a perfect match between the, uh, between the, what we call the exact solution and, and the reconstruction model. Uh, for example, we, we often uh, assume that this un, uh, the, the exact solution is zero outside the interval of interest. Then we generate some data that is actually in accordance with such a model and then we reconstruct. So that, that, that's what we sometimes call inverse crime. Inverse crime means that we generate data by means of a certain model and then we're using the same model to, to reconstruct the solution. Right. But of course, that's not what really happens in, in the real world because there the forward model is the physics. And the physics doesn't you know, assume that suddenly something it jumps to zero. It, you get contributions from everywhere. So those zero assumptions are part of the reconstruction model, so they're different. Anyway, but to test software, it's very nice to actually start by committing this inverse crime. You want to do that because if you, if you cannot def define a working regularization algorithm that cannot handle situations with inverse crime, then you might as well give up. That's the first thing you do. First you do inverse crime and if you get your things to work for that, then you move on and you, and you try, you know, some, some more complicated situations. Okay, so uh, hmm, what are we going to do here? What are we going to do about this? Um, we make some assumptions about how this, this function we're trying to reconstruct, what that actually looks like outside the interval where we're actually trying to reconstruct it. Okay, so, um, so we need to know, we need to, to assume something about how that function behaves. And uh, one, the one particular uh, assumption I'm going to be talking about here is what is called re reflexive uh, boundary conditions. So let me illustrate that over here. Let's see. Right. So of course we we have our reconstruction interval here from, from 0 to 1. So we are interested in, 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 in computing a solution in this interval here, but we would like to make some assumption about how the function behaves uh, outside of that interval. And with, bound, with the reflexive boundary conditions, what you do is that you essentially you take your function here and then you, 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 you flip it over, over here, on this boundary here, you flip it over. And on this boundary here, you also do the same, you take this function here, you flip it over. Right. And then you assume that the measured data that you've got up here has contributions, not just for, from this part here, but also from the parts out here. But notice we have not introduced extra unknowns here because 
if you if you know what a, 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 a value of f here, it's going to be the same value as a function there, and if you know it's a function value there, it's going to be the same there. So we haven't introduced more unknowns. We're just saying that we we, we utilize those values in this particular reflexive way <coughs> outside this uh, this interval here. So in mathematical terms, if we're going to do that, well, well, the okay, I should say the the, the, the reasoning behind this is that it's it, it's 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 probably n not really reflecting how that function behaves far away from the interval that we're interested in, because who knows what happens out here? But close to this boundary here, it's probably not such a bad idea to assume that maybe this function here just continues a little bit in the same way on the other side of the interval and the same thing on the other side of the interval. All right? So anyway, anyway, in mathematical terms what we're doing is we are, we are introducing a new function here, now a, a function that incorporates these boundary, or represents these boundary conditions. Now that lives in the interval from minus one to two, so much uh, bigger interval here. And in the middle interval it's, it's exactly the function we're trying to reconstruct. And then to the left it's the function flipped in, in uh, here in zero, and here it's it's the function flipped in in one. Okay, so then we get this. Okay, right. And now let's see if that was actually the function below the ground. What signal would we then measure? Well, of course, we would plug in the 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 extended function here into our integral here. Now we integrate from from minus one to two. And, and then, of course, we can break that integration interval up into three intervals. And in those three intervals, we have different expressions for the function fbc. And if we plug that in, we arrive at this relation right there. And then you'll see what happened is that, for example, here, instead of, of writing f of minus t, I write f of t and then I put the minus t over here. And here f of 2 minus t becomes f of t and then the 2 minus t goes over here instead. Right? And that means that we can, we can, we can pull these three integrals out and uh, we, get, we get something here. Let's see. Let's see. So we have, we have an integral again. It goes from 0 to 1. Here's the unknown function, but there's just a more complicated kernel here, okay? So this reflects the fact that, that we are only reconstructing in the interval from 0 to 1, but we are utilizing the, this assumption here that, that the function continues in this particular way outside that interval. So that means that the, re, the forward model is, is, uh, is still this, this kernel here, but now the reconstruction model that takes into account these assumptions about what, happen, about what happens on the boundary, they give rise to a modified kernel that you see right there. Okay, okay. So, so, so the reconstruction model is different from the forward model in that it, Im, it Im, implicitly, or maybe explicitly if you want, incorporates these particular reflexive boundary conditions. Right, so that looks very complicated, but it's a good idea, definitely, because if we do that for this particular problem I've been talking about, then you see uh, we, we do get rid of all these oscillations here coming from, from the mismatch. And of course, the assumptions about reflexive boundary conditions is, 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 is not an assumption that we now suddenly know how our uh, function behaves like everywhere from minus infinity to infinity. It's just something that takes care of what happens close to the boundary boundaries. And you see, sure enough, these annoying oscillations that we had before now go away. We have a, a, a solution here using reflexive boundary conditions, which is the black one there, and it's almost on top of the exact solution, which is the blue one. If one looks really, really carefully, one can see glimpses of a blue solution behind the black one right there. So, so, so that's the thing. It, it, it really helps to, uh, 
to in, in, incorporate such boundary conditions there, which is an educated guess of how the function might look like. And of course we do it here for this particular 1D problem, but it's also very important in, in 2D problems, in image deep learning, image reconstruction, and so on and so forth. And the last thing I'm going to cover here is just, uh, you know, what this means for our matrix structure. Because now suddenly we're not going to have that very nice um, toplets matrix structure anymore, right? Because we have these, if we discretize the problem with only this guy here and forget about the, the other two guys that take care of the boundary conditions, then of course we'll have a toplets matrix. But now we also have these two guys here in mind. And uh, well, so, so, so we'll have, and we can think of it as actually, let's associate one matrix with the middle here, another matrix and a left associated with this, com this part there of the kernel and a third matrix associated with the, uh, with the right part there. Let's see how that goes. And here are the corresponding elements of these two additional matrices, okay? So you see here's a left, a right, and the elements of a left are of course samples of this particular function there, and they look like that. And for the, for the, for the right matrix here, the, the uh, matrix elements are given by, by this guy here, right. Again, again, I ignore this factor one over n here, right. So you see there's again structure here if you look at the indices i and j, but it's a little different than we had before. Before, for the Toblitz matrix, we would have matrix elements that only uh, depended on the difference between the i and the j. And here, basically, they uh, depend on the sum of i and j. So that's the main difference, okay? And, of course, this particular matrix structure uh, gives rise to matrices that also are named after a German mathematician, in this case, uh, Hankel. These are called Hankel matrices, right? So uh, let's see now, let's see now. So a Hankel matrix, a Hankel matrix is a matrix where you have the same elements along all the anti-diagonals, right? So here's your matrix, and then you have maybe the element seven here along the main diagonal and then, and then you could have the element two sitting there and then the element five, no there's not a five, five, like something like that. That would be, that would be a Hankel matrix. You have the same elements along all the anti-diagonals. That's a Hankel matrix. And for the particular case we're looking at, we have this structure there. Of course, MATLAB can also work with Hankel matrices, right? Uh, so how does all that fit into what we're trying to do because we're trying to handle this expanded kernel here with the boundary conditions in, in a way that utilizes matrix structure. So here goes, it turns out that the matrix we're going to be dealing with that incorporates these boundary conditions is just a simple modification of the matrix A, the topless matrix A that we originally had and I think to explain what goes on, uh, it's, it's, it's much easier to look at an, an, an example like that. So let's assume this is our A matrix. Okay, then you look at these diagonals here again, and you look at this here, two, 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 and then there's a two spilling over the edge. So, so imagine that you would actually have like a, like a two sitting out there. And then you have the one here, one, 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 and that spills over again. So you have a one there and you'll have a one there. And then uh, the, you have zeros spilling over and I'm not going to draw all the, all the zeros, all right? And the same thing over here, you have two spilling over the edge there. You have one spilling over there, and again you have zeros, and I'm not drawing that. So to obtain the two correction matrices, which are both Hankel, what you do is you, they, these elements that spill over here, over the edge, you f flip them in, flip them in, and, and put them in, in, in a matrix. So you see this two, 
one, one, you flip them over, that gives a two, one, one sitting up here. And the same here, two, one, one, becomes a two, one, one when it's flipped back in, inside. So that's the correction matrix that we're going to be dealing with here. And then we, when we sum it up, of course, we, we get this is a Toplitz matrix plus this guy here. And this is a tom, sum of two Hankel matrices, uh, so it's still a Hankel matrix. So that's a Toplitz plot plus Hankel matrix structure. And uh, um, wow, what a complicated structure we have there. But there's some uh, interesting structure that we can utilize. But before we do that, let's take a short break here. Let's take a break.